A prayer there is made true stand tall, but let's just, let's just be honest, okay? Honesty, I think, is really good. Let's be honest. Some of us at times have wrestled with doubt, haven't you? You ever been to a place you go, okay, I, maybe you go, I believe this God thing, but this part of it I struggle with. Maybe you're not even there yet. You're like, man, I know some people who really believe strongly about this, but I've just not seen it, or, or I believe this part, but man, there's, there, there's a lot of us that struggle at some point in time or at a phase of life. You've, you've hit a, a moment where you just, you just wrestled with some kind of doubt, and it caused all these questions to rise up, or sometimes the other way around. Sometimes you have a question. And you don't ask that question, you dwell on that question, that question leads to other questions, all of a sudden you have all these questions and you, you never ask those questions and all of a sudden you start, the questions multiply and it starts giving way to like doubt, like is this thing for real? Speaking of just spiritual things. And, and, and you know, just, let's, just, let's call it, like, that is a normal part of spiritual growth. That, that is so normal, but we get afraid of it, don't we? That, that scares us. Doubt tends to scare us. Because in our own minds, this is what, ha- this is what happens. And, and to be honest, there's, there's maybe some places where you've experienced this. But you've got this doubt. You've got this question. You've got this thing that you're unsure about. You, you're, you're doubting. But you don't want to voice that doubt, at least not in church. Because doubt, as you see it, doubt means that, that you don't believe. And if you don't believe, then you don't have faith. And if you don't have faith then you can't be a real Christian. If you're not a real Christian, then I'm going to be rejected by the church. Or maybe we've not ever actually cognitively thought through that process, but that's oftentimes what cripples us in our doubt, isn't it? And you know what happens is, is doubt that lingers over time, that it never is allowed to be voiced, oftentimes then turns to unbelief. Have you seen somebody experience that before? They're coming to church, they're doing the thing, they're, they're involved in Christian activity, and then all of a sudden, they, it just seems like, boom, they're gone. You go, what happened? Well, oftentimes, it's like they had these questions that were never asked. They had these doubts that, that never surfaced, and they just internalize them, and they, and, and they keep them silent and quiet, and they, and they just brew on them. And next thing you know, you go, man, I got too many doubts and too many questions, this thing can't be, and it leads to unbelief. But... But I hope, and I just want to, I don't want to express, and, and I believe this, not, this is not just for me, but for leadership, the heart of this church, is that I recognize that, 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 that we recognize that doubt can be not only a normal part of the Christian experience, but a healthy one. Because in my opinion, and in my perspective, this is how I see doubt playing out. Doubt leads us to ask questions, and those questions, when answered, leads us to truth. And truth builds our faith. I mean, it's one thing to learn cognitively, like to, to intellectually learn truth, and we learn it and we internalize it and we're indoctrinated by it and all that kind of stuff. But truth that is wrestled with sticks stronger once you discover it, doesn't it? Truth that you've had to experience, and I'm questioning God's faithfulness, and he doesn't really care, but then all of a sudden, you're wrestling, and you're pursuing, and you're, you're, you're looking at, and you're seeking for that truth, and God proves himself faithful, and guess what? You know he's faithful more than the one that just told it. So in my opinion, and, and I believe in Jesus' as well, that these doubts that, that are normal need to be surfaced, and questions ought to be asked. Because those questions and those doubts steer us towards truth. And that truth is going to build and grow our faith. We're going to be stronger. So don't let those doubts cripple you. You see, you're not the first one. Here's another lie from the door. You're not the first one who's ever had a doubt about that thing. Whatever that thing is, right? You're not the first one that's ever asked questions. You're not the first one that's been uncertain. You're not the first one that's ever been on the fence. In fact, Jesus addresses a group of people in our text today in John chapter 5. And if you've got your Bibles, or if you've got a Bible, you can turn there with us today. John chapter 5. Let me catch up. We had a little break last week for our summer kick. Wasn't that fun, that summer kickoff outdoors, worshiping with everybody and barbecues? It was good. God was gracious. It was only like 93 degrees outside. Uh, <laughs> last week though it could have been worse we all know it 
But, um, but before that, we were, we were walking through this, and we'd been in, in John chapter 4. We just finished John chapter 5, took a couple, uh, a couple weeks in John chapter 5, and there, the beginning of John chapter 5 is really the beginning of the story that is, we're going to cap off today. See, Jesus, walks, or Jesus meets a man who, who, who'd been crippled, who'd been lame for 38 years. And he goes up to him, and, and, he, and he heals this man, and he tells him right away, uh, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. And so he does. But here's the problem. Some of the religious folks, some of the religious leaders saw him do this and got all upset. Not because he was healed, because he picked up his mat. It was the Sabbath. Now, we know the law, right? The, the law of God in, in the Bible says that you're not supposed to work or do any work on the Sabbath. That's what, that's what God prescribed. And don't, don't work on the Sabbath. And the, these religious guys had taken that and just built on God's law and, and had defined it in, in the most detailed way and said, you're not supposed to carry your mat on the Sabbath. And it's not this like big like mattress he's carrying around. He's just he's rolled up his little mat, put it under his arm, and he's walking off. They said, you can't do that. And they got all bent out of shape. Because Jesus had told them to do something that their traditions weren't. Told them it was not allowed. So they approach Jesus like, what are you doing? Who do you think you are? He says, oh, I'm glad you asked. I'm the son of God. I'm paraphrasing now. And they wanted to kill him. Blasphemy, right? They wanted to kill him. And so they're so angry. And so what does Jesus do? He uses that as a great opportunity to teach on the authority that he has of God <laughs> to a group that already wants to kill him. Now, this is taking place, and, this is, and, and what we're doing is this teaching that we're about to see. This is what we looked at a couple weeks ago, and this is the second half of it that we're going to take today. And he starts out by saying that I have all authority of God. Now, he's speaking directly to, in the temple to a group of people who hate him and, and want him dead, devising ways to kill him. However, they're not the only ones around. John's there. He's writing a firsthand account of it. I would imagine the other 12, and it's the, it's the temple. There's people all over, and, and, and there's... Probably all kinds of people. People from his, John and, his, and the 12 are going, I'm with you, Jesus, no matter what. Gee, oh, and they're ready to pull a sword and fight. To defend him while the ones he's speaking to are ready to pull a sword and chop his head off. And then, however, you know that in the crowd there's going to be a variety of people. Some of those people who are like, I'm following Jesus, but if things get to like get start riled up. I'm out of here. I'm not, I'm not that far in. I'm not really sure. Then there's others who are like, I'm not really sure, he, but he does miracles. And they're kind of on the fence. Like, I, the miracle thing is cool, but I'm not really sure. He says some pretty uncomfortable things. In this crowd of people, undoubtedly, there was all these different people who had a lot of different opinions and responses to who Jesus is. So Jesus takes this opportunity, speaking to the opposition but addressing, I believe, everyone, and says, let me tell you who I am. I have authority over nature. God the Father has given me authority over life, authority over death, authority over eternity. God has given me, the Father has given me authority to judge the hearts and the lives of all mankind. I am God. Now, Jesus didn't wait for a response because he, he, he knew what they were thinking. They're thinking, well, sure, you can say that, but prove it. Right? Anybody can say that they're God, but I want to prove it. How can you just, who do you think you are? You just come up here and say that you're God. And that's where we jump into our text today. John chapter 5, starting with 31. Now, I'm going I'm to just tell you something here. I said we're going to kind of study through the text a little bit today. I am not by nature, by like my natural default, I'm not like this, like this incredible Bible scholar. That's not who I am. I, I've, I've learned some practices that help me, but that, I, I'm not the type that just like gets all excited to just study Greek and Hebrew. Like that's, I, I don't read it. I, don't, I, I just use the tools that are available to me. In fact, go to BibleHub.com. If, if you like to study, go to BibleHub.com, and that's where I get a lot of my biblical study tools. It's just simple. Um, that being said, there's value in studying the Word of God. 
So I may, and I may not be, this might not be my, my default, but, but sometimes you look at a text and go, God, I don't, I don't understand what you're saying. In fact, <laughs> there, there's some text in two weeks. I can't wait to preach in two weeks. It's a, f- a fun story, and I can't wait. There's themes in there that are powerful. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. However, the text that we come to today is a text that I've been dreading for the last two weeks. <laughs> um, <laughs> Not because it's, I, just, I just didn't, I didn't know what was there. I didn't, what, what do we got? And literally, because, I mean, because we had last week, we, we took a break from John, so I've had two weeks to look at this thing, and it wasn't until Friday night, literally, you can ask Beth, I was sitting on, in, in my room and going, there it is, I got it. It wasn't until Friday night, well, I see something I never saw before. It wasn't this mysterious truth, it was just I, I did some digging. It's amazing what happens when you study the Word of God. I encourage you, study the Word of God. Um, and so we're going to study. one of the, the And we're going to use essentially one Bible study tool that is really common. It's a common literary tactic of, of a lot of the biblical authors, and that is the, the, the literary device of repetition. You see, when I, was first, when I first read this text, I went, okay, that's great. Jesus is just defending himself to the opposition. But but there are certain themes that we're going to find in this text that I think we, don't, that we, we may miss if we don't notice some of the repetition. And so we're just going to take this kind of piece by piece. So I encourage you to follow along. Let's look at the first, the first three verses. Chapter, or chapter 5, verse 31. If I testify about myself, my testimony is not valid. There's another who testifies in my favor, and I know that his testimony about me is valid. You have sent to me John, and he has testified to the truth. Do you find any repetition in there? What do you see over and over again? Testimony. That's one that jumped out at me right away, and we're going to get to that in just a second. I'm I'm tricking Pastor Robin down here. Um, Testify, or testimony, was was the word that that leaped off the page when when I first started reading it, or when I first began to discover this. From verse 31 to verse 39, uh, John, or Jesus, who's, who John's quoting here, Jesus uses that word, or some derivative of that word, nine times in nine verses. He's driving home a point. So when I began to look at this and study this, I realized, well, that's not even the first repetitive word that he uses. Verse 31 to 33, there's another word that's repeated three times. Can you find it? Do you know what that word is? Now, now you can answer. Truth. Truth. True. Yeah. Now, some of your translations go, I don't see that three times. That's why we study the scripture. If I testify by myself, my testimony is not true. Some of the translations will say valid. There's another who testifies in my favor, and I know that his testimony about me is true or valid. You have sent to John, and he has testified to the truth. Now, that word true or valid in the Greek, is actually the same word used three different times. So in the original text, Jesus is saying the same thing three times in a row. So, okay, noteworthy. Let, let, let's look into that. What is he getting at here? What, what is Jesus, what is his point in this? Why is he repeating this? Three sentences he makes, uses the same word in all three of those sentences. That's enough to, to catch one's attention. But, but look at how he says it. If I testify about myself, my testimony is not true? That doesn't even make sense, does it? Because there's somebody else that testifies about me, and his testimony is true. Who's he talking about? John, right? John the Baptist. And he says that, that when he testifies, he testifies to the truth. So Jesus is saying, what I say is not true, but what John says is true, even though what John say and I say are the same thing. Something's off, right? So I did some digging. And like I said, I don't read Greek, but I did some studying. That's why I never use Greek words when I talk to you, because I don't know how to pronounce them. So uh, the word that is translated here, valid or truth, is the same word. And let me give you what its meaning is, its definition. It carries with it a little bit of um, a nuance that our word truth doesn't necessarily always carry. See, it means this. It means... Literally, the literal translation of that word, truth or valid, is what cannot be hidden. What cannot be hidden. And it stresses the undeniable reality when something is fully tested. 
So what Jesus is saying here is not that what he testifies about himself isn't accurate. It's that it, it can't be tested. It's just his word. He's saying, you, you, you don't take me at my word, and I get it. You can't test it. You can't prove it. It's just, it just one person's word against yours. So it is not valid. It is not something that absolutely cannot be hidden. It, it, it just, it's mine. But listen, there is somebody whose word you do trust. There is somebody whose voice is a trusted voice in your life. John the Baptist. Remember, he was the first prophet that, they, that Israel had seen in 400 years. He said, listen, you came out to, to John. You were baptized by John. He said, be, repent and be baptized. You repented, you repented and were baptized and, and there's forgiveness. And remember him, you trusted him, you looked to him. And we all know, everybody agreed, his testimony is valid. It's something that, that cannot be hidden. We knew that he was from God. But this is what he says. We continue reading. If I testify about myself, my testimony is not valid. There's another who testifies, verse 33, you have sent to John and he has testified to the truth. Not that I accept human testimony, but I mention it that you may be saved. John was a lamp that burned and gave light. And you chose for a time to enjoy his truth. We'll remember that phrase in a, for a time in a moment here. So here this is what Jesus is saying as we set this thing up. He said, I have all authority of God, all the authority over nature, over life, over death, over eternity. I have authority to judge. I am God. But you're looking for something that's provable. You're looking for something that is undeniably true. You're looking for, for something that, 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 is, that is clearly and obviously the truth, something that is, that is undeniably the undeniable reality when it is fully tested. It's okay. Basically, what you're saying is you want some evidence, right? You want some proof. I'm telling you who I am, but you are on a pursuit of truth. You want to know what's real. You want to be able to trust something. So here, let me, let me, let me give you some evidence. And now John, or Jesus, I guess, goes into uh, uh, his next bit of content that he's beginning to explain is all about evidence, all about proof. The next word that we see repeated over and over and over and over again is that word testimony or testify. This, this word could be, be translated testify, but also has that, the meaning of, of witness or evidence. What Jesus is saying here is, listen, you are seeking the truth, so let me give you, let me show you what's right in front of you. Let me show you the evidence that you're looking for. And he starts off with this. He starts off by saying, John is a trusted voice of truth. You trusted him and you listened to him for a time. But when did they bail off of the, the, the John bandwagon? As soon as he starts saying what? He says, he says repent. And they were, they were coming to him to repent. It wasn't until he, and they said, the Messiah is coming. And they were okay with that. When they said Jesus is the Messiah, they're like, you're nuts. It's funny to me how many people are like, hey, this person is a voice of truth in my life, and this, this person is a guide to it. They're just all about that Jesus thing, and I just don't quite get that Jesus thing. Man, they got great, they're full of wisdom and whatever. We, we, we pick and choose what we want to hear. And that's what, that's what these, the, the, these, these Pharisees, these religious leaders were doing. Like Jesus saying, you, you believed him until he said the truth about me, and then you stopped believing. You want evidence. You don't want to just take my word, take his word for it. But here, you want more evidence than that. You need a greater testimony than that. Here, let's go to the next one. The next piece of evidence, the next piece of testimony that Jesus uh, draws on, we find in verse... Um, we find in verse 36. I have testimony weightier than that of John. Okay, so you don't trust my word. I get that. You don't trust his word. You, you should. You did. But okay, let's go to the next step. For the very work that the Father has given me to finish and which I am doing testifies is the evidence that the Father has sent me. Now he's saying, hey, guys. Like, I just healed a guy who'd been lame for 38 years. I told him to get up, and he got up. 
and you're bent out of shape that he carried his mat. You're missing it. You've seen the hand of God in your life, the undeniable hand of God in your life. You want evidence, you want proof, you want to believe that, that, that I am the truth. Just look around you at what God is doing in your life and the lives of the people around you. Look at God's interaction with his world. Look at his supreme uh, control over creation. Look at what God is doing. The undeniable work of God, the undeniable hand of God is at work all around you. Would you just look at the evidence that's before you? And then he says, he goes, okay, uh, but you still don't get that. So, So let's go to a third one. I got more evidence for you. Verse 37. And the Father who sent me has himself testified concerning me. But God is my witness. You have never heard his voice, nor seen his form. Nor does his word dwell in you, for you do not believe the one he sent. Let me just tell you, that would have been offensive to them. He's speaking to the religious leaders, the top dogs in the religious world. Because you don't know God. You've not experienced God. You don't know the love of God because you haven't received me. Because you've not accepted me. You diligently seek the scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life. Wait a second. Isn't that true? (laughs) Don't we go to the scriptures to find life? Don't we go to the scripture to find uh, life forever, to go to heaven? Isn't this where we go to find eternal life? What's Jesus talking about? So you diligently study the scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life. These are the scriptures that testify about me. You refuse to come to me to have life. They had memorized massive chunks of the Old Testament. They knew it. They'd given their lives to it. I mean, they were all about knowing the word. And Jesus here is saying, listen, don't you get it? Here, you want the greatest evidence of all. This should be especially evident to you. You have, from the, from the time you were young, studied the scripture and studied what God wrote. And you memorized these lists of laws. But do you not see the most obvious point of the whole entire scripture? That it's all about me. You see, even if we just took the Bible on a historical point, so it's not divine, okay? If you want to go that route, if you just took the historical side of this, Jesus was a historical figure. That's really hard for anybody to to argue with. You want to say he's not the son of God, whatever, but but he lived. There's a lot of things, I mean, there's evidence that Jesus was a historical figure. And we know lots about his life. And we also know that the large majority of this book, the Old Testament, we know was written before he came. And we also know that the life of Jesus fulfills prophecy after prophecy after prophecy after prophecy after prophecy after prophecy. And yet so many choose just, just to miss that. The the, the very word of God, the, the, the unchanging word of God screams of the divinity of Jesus. And yet, they chose not to see it. See, I believe Jesus could have just kept on going with more and more pieces of evidence. But he shifts gear here, and this is where we begin to see another word. Let's see if you can catch it. He says in verse 41, I do not accept praise from men, but I know you. (laughs) Uh, He's just ticking them off. Um, I don't accept praise from men, (laughs) but I know you guys. I know that you don't have the love of God in your hearts. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not accept me. But if someone else comes in his own name, you will accept him. How can you believe if you accept praise from one another, yet you make no effort to obtain the praise that comes 
from the only God. See another word that surfaces in there? Accept. 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 Now this is a word that I really did enjoy uh, learning a little bit about. So, so I, I looked this word up. Um, and just so you know, not every word has like nuances to it that we don't have. Like the word testimony basically means the same thing that our word testimony would, carries the same weight as it would. But this word accept was, was, was particularly interesting to me. See, our word accept, or maybe in your translation, as you're following along, it might have said received in the same place it said accept. Both accept and receive, are those active words or passive words? Well, those are passive, aren't they? You accept something that happens to you. You receive something that happens to you. Um, except, in the Greek, this word, it's, I guess it's lambano. That's what we're going to go with. Um, this word lambano, it, it, it means accept or to receive, except it carries with it a nuance that is different than, than how we, and man, I think this is, is vital to understanding this text. It is not a passive word at all, it is, an, it is an active word. Listen to the definitions of this word here, except. To actively lay hold of, to take or receive. To lay hold of aggressively or actively accepting what is available or offered. It emphasizes the volition or assertiveness of the receiver. It is to accept with initiative. You see, I think sometimes we have difficulty when we talk about accepting Jesus and believing in Jesus. We kind of use those as synonymous, right? I have accepted Jesus. I believe in him. But then we look at James, and James says, well, even the demons believe in Jesus. They have not accepted him. There's a difference. And Jesus here is saying, listen, you've accepted. What does he talk about? He contrasts acceptance of him with acceptance of what? What do you see in the text? He contrasts acceptance of Jesus with acceptance of approval of man. He says, you accept approval of man. Now, now what is he saying? Is he saying in in our, our passive understanding of the word accept, is he saying that when people praise you or when people give you uh, congratulate you, then you're supposed to like just, just, just like cower, like, no, 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 don't say that. No, you can accept, you can say thanks, hey, I appreciate that. That's not what he's talking about. Do you accept it? Do you lambano the praise of man? Do, do you actively pursue it in order to take hold of it? That's what he's, he's speaking to the, the, these, these Jews, these, these people about. Now listen, you are active, you are seeking the approval of man, and you could care less about what God thinks about you. Have you accepted Jesus doesn't just mean do you believe that, that he is God. To accept Christ means to actively pursue, it means to aggressively, to actively, assertively, to, to act with initiative towards receiving all that he has for us. See, it's different than maybe the way that we've, we've commonly come to understand it. This active pursuit. See, this thing started when Jesus says, I have all authority. I am God, but you guys want truth. You're seeking truth. Here's all the evidence. Guess what? Jesus could have listed evidence all day long, but they would have never seen the evidence. They would have never believed in the evidence until they choose to actively pursue the truth but rather they're actively pursuing justification from those around them they're actively pursuing praise from those around them and that leads us to the last word that we see here the last word here let's see if you can find this one back up start in verse 44 there's a little overlapping there verse 44 says how can you believe if you accept praise from one another yet make no effort to obtain praise that comes from the only god but do not think, I will accuse you before the Father. Your accuser is Moses, on whom your hopes are set. Let me just tell you what that means right there. Moses authored the first five books of the Bible, the, the, the Torah or the Pentateuch, which they held up very, very highly. And they said, listen, I'm not going to accuse you. I'm not going to have to accuse you. Moses is going to accuse you because you say that you believe all that Moses says, but you don't live like you believe it. And then he goes into verse 46. If, Moses, if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But since you do not believe what he wrote, how are you going to believe what I say? 
Do you see another word that, that, that surfaces here? Believe. Do you remember how, how John sums up his entire book? We've mentioned it a number of times now throughout the course of the study. John chapter 20, verse 31. It says, these were written, basically the entire book, the, his, his gospel. It says, I wrote this. I'm going to tell you why I wrote this. These were written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So if you were to sum it up to one thing, why did Jesus write, or why did John write the book of John? For what? We might believe. Actually, I tricked you. I kind of led you that direction. That's not really where it's at. Because if it was just to believe, then he would have wrote, these were written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, period, and then gone on. But he didn't. It's a comma. That you would believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, he continues, and by believing you would have what? Life. See, John's writing to the church. He says, listen, this is, this, is, this is about the life that God promises. John 10, 10, we say it all the time. I have come. Jesus says, I have come that you'd have life and you'd have it to the fullest. And John says, I want you to know the fullness of the life that God desires for you to live today. This is not fire insurance. This is not security from hell. This is not I'm living this life so that someday I can make it. This is I can experience the fullness of the life that God has for me now. Amen. And how do we get that? How do we receive that? By believing that Jesus is the Son of God. So how does my doubt play into all this? That that doubt evidently, obviously, like deters belief, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. But didn't you say doubt is good? Yeah, it can be. But your doubt is going to stymie your your belief. It will. I mean, that's, that's kind of the definition of doubt, right? And over, there's five times in Matthew where Jesus says, oh, you of little faith. One time in, in, in chapter 14 where Peter is walking on the water and sinks, he says, you of little faith, why do you doubt? What we see in, in that example right there is doubt is, is going to work against faith. And when doubt works against faith, we miss out on, on, on the fullness of life that God intended. And, and read all of those cases where, where they doubted, and Jesus says, why you have little faith? And, and they missed out on what God wanted for them, the goodness that God wanted for them, because they doubted. They're like, wait, this doesn't fit how you started, with the whole doubt is good. And this is, this is where I want us to see, is that doubt can be ought to be used and engaged to grow us in stronger faith. But sometimes we have one of these two perspectives. Either doubt is this thing that's like, I, I can't address so it lingers, or it's this thing that we've just grow accustomed to and it lingers. And both is, is so dangerous and detrimental to our, our life of faith. See, what I mean by that is this, is that sometimes you go, I believe in God, I just, you know, I just have this issue with this part of it. I just have some questions about this. But we never seek to answer the questions. We, just, we, just, we, we grow okay with not fully believing. Yeah, I love Jesus and I love the God stuff, but there's this, there's this part about this part that I just like, ah, man, I'm just not sure if I'm all the way there yet. And you have no desire to resolve the doubt. You just go, ah, I just can't know everything, so I'm just going to live with this. I, I can, I'll be okay with this, this certain percentage level of doubt. If you want to live the fullness of the life that Christ intended you to live, it is a life of faith, and it is a life of full belief, and we will receive life proportionate to our, to our belief in him. Like, that sounds too conditional. Well, why didn't the, the disciples receive and walk in some of the fullness of life that they walked in? Because Jesus kept saying, you have so little faith. So what did Jesus do? He patiently, oh, I mean, sometimes I think he, I, I'm picturing an eye roll, but he's probably more respectful than that. But, uh, oh, guys, come on again. And yet he stayed with them. And he was patient with their unbelief. 
and he was patient with their doubt, and he kept leading them to places of stronger faith until eventually they became the foundation of the church as we know it today. Wrestling with doubt can be scary. But can I encourage you in two different ways? One, don't hide it. It'll eat you up and it'll kill you. And don't just grow okay with it. Because it's going to steal the fullness of God from you. So what do you do with it? What do you do with that doubt? You resolve it. How? You seek the truth. Well, you know what? That's what, the, that's what those religious guys would have said they were doing. We want truth, right? That's why Jesus says, you don't take my word, let me give you some evidence. And the evidence was clear. You trusted this, this voice that you trusted, voice of God that you trusted, but you reject him. Here's the miracles that you agreed were from God, and then you rejected them. Here's the evidence of Scripture that you know so well, and then you rejected that. Why? Because you weren't really after truth. You're after the, the approval of man. You, you were accepting, actively accepting approval of people. You were taking initiative to get what you thought you wanted, what was going to make justification for your lifestyle. You know what? So many times I think people say that they're truly seeking truth, but they're really just seeking justification for their lifestyle. They, they, they say, well, I'm really just seeking truth, but they're really just looking for defense of their doubt. I've got these doubts, and so I'm going to find ways to validate my doubt. That's not seeking truth. That's running from truth. Seeking truth means I come, and, I, and I'm able to evaluate the evidence that's before me. And if that evidence leads me uh, in, in the direction, this direction, then I take it. But if it leads me towards Christ, then I'll go with it. So many of us, we're, we, we stand in opposition to where Christ is leading us, and we call that doubt, and we call that seeking truth. It's not seeking truth, it's seeking defense of our doubt. So what are you looking for? What do you accept today? Do you accept lambano? Do you, do you, do you seek after truth? Or are you seeking after approval of man? Seeking after a comfortable lifestyle? Seeking after just enough God to make me feel happy, but just enough X, Y, and Z in order to keep it? See, that's where, the, that's where those guys were. Had enough God to make them feel holy, but enough of them to stay in control. Seek truth and go where it takes you. Accept Jesus. It doesn't just mean, oh, you know, shout out to the man upstairs. But we pursue. This is what I believe with all my heart. As we pursue, if we seek truth, our doubts will be resolved. As we seek truth, our doubts will be resolved. So how does the doubt thing work? It's good and it's healthy as it drives us to truth. If we're willing to accept the truth that it leads us to. But don't let it linger. Don't hide it. Don't grow comfortable with it. Because it will steal what God intended for you to live. The life that is full of and rich and abundant. Let's seek truth. Together, let's seek truth. Let's go where he, follow, where he leads. God, I thank you so much for the truth of your word.